Gilgamesh, the ancient Sumerian king. As it is probable that the materials of the Gilgamesh epic, the great mythological poem of Babylonia, originally belonged to the older epoch of Babylonian mythology, it is fitting that it should be described and considered before passing to the later development of Chaldean religion. The Gilgamesh epic ranks with the Babylonian myth of creation as one of the greatest literary productions of ancient Babylonia. The main element in its composition is a conglomeration of mythic matter which are drawn from various sources with perhaps a substratum of historic fact which has been woven into a continuous narrative around the central figure of Gilgamesh, Prince of Erech. It is not possible at present to fix a date to when the epic was first written. Our knowledge of it is gleaned chiefly from mutilated fragments belonging to the library of Asher Bani Pal. But from internal and other evidence, we gather that some of these ancient traditions embodied in the epic are of much greater antiquity than his reign. Thus a tablet dated to 2100 BC contains a variant of the deluge story inserted into the 11th tablet of the Gilgamesh epic. Probably this and other portions of the epic existed in oral tradition before they were committed to writing. This would be in the remote Sumerian period. Ashur Banipal was an enthusiastic and practical patron of literature in his great library at Nineveh, the main part of which had been taken from Kalar by Sennacherib. He had gathered the vast collections of volumes, clay tablets and papyri, most of which had been carried as spoil from conquered lands, meaning that these myths were taken to control the populace and rewritten to serve a particular lineage. He also employed scribes to copy older texts, and this is evidently how the existing edition of the Gilgamesh epic came to be written. From the fragments now in the British Museum, it would seem that at least four copies of the poem were made in the time of Ashurbanipal. They were not long permitted to remain undisturbed. The great Assyrian Empire was already declining. The ancient city of Nineveh was captured and its library scattered, while plundering hordes burnt the precious scrolls of papyrus and buried the clay tablets in the debris of the palace which had sheltered them. They were destined to lie for 2,000 years till the excavations of A. H. Layard, George Smith and others brought them to light. It is true that the 12 tablets of the Gilgamesh epic, or rather the fragments of them which have so far been discovered, are defaced and broken. Frequently, the entire sense of a passage is obscured by a gap in the text. And this, when nice mythological elucidations are in question, is no light matter. Yet to such an extent has the science of comparative religion progressed in recent years that we are now probably better able to read the true mythological significance of the epic than the ancient Babylonians themselves, who saw in it merely the wanderings and exploits of a national hero. The epic, which centers around the ancient city of Erech, relates the adventures of a half-human, half-divine hero, Gilgamesh by name, who is king over a wreck. Two other characters figure prominently in the narrative, Yabani, who evidently typifies primitive man, and Utnapishtim, the hero of the Babylonian deluge myth. Each of the three would seem to have been originally the hero of a separate group of traditions, which in time became incorporated more or less naturally with the other two. The first and most important of the trio 
The hero, Gilgamesh, may have been at one time a real person, though nothing is known of him historically. Possibly the exploits of some ancient king of Arrak have furnished a basis for the narrative. His name, for a time provisionally read as Gishtubar or Isdabar, but now known to have been pronounced Gilgamesh. The name suggests that he was not a Babylonian, but Elamite or Kassite in origin. And from the indications furnished by the poem itself, we learn that he conquered a wreck, or relieved the city from a besieging force at the outset of his adventurous career. It has also been suggested that he was identical with the biblical Nimrod, like him, a hero of ancient Babylon. So much for the historical aspect of Gilgamesh, his mythological character is more easily established. In this regard, he was a personification of the sun. He represents, in fact, the fusion of a great national hero with a mythical being. Throughout the epic, there are indications that Gilgamesh is partly divine by nature, though nothing specific is said on its head. His identity with the solar god is veiled in the popular narrative, meaning it is disguised. But it is evident that he had some connection with the sun god Shamash, to whom he pays his devotions, and who acts as patron and protector. This would be the second time we have seen this mentioned, the fusion of a great national hero with a mythological being. It would appear to be no different with other mythological savior characters. But to whom or what are we really being led to believe in? The Birth of Gilgamesh Among the traditions concerning his birth is one related by Elian, Historia Alemannium, XII 21, of Gilgamos, Gilgamesh, the grandson of So Karos. So Karos, who, according to Barossus, was the first king to reign Babylonia after the deluge who was warned by means of divination that his daughter should bear a son who would deprive him of his throne. Thinking to frustrate the designs of fate, he locked her away in a tower where she was closely watched, but in time she bore a son, and her attendants, knowing how rough the king would be to learn of the event, they flung the child from the tower. But before the child reached the ground, an eagle seized him up and bore him to a certain garden where he was duly found and cared for by a peasant. And when he grew to manhood, he became king of the Babylonians, having presumably usurped the throne from his grandfather. Here we have a myth, obviously of solar significance conforming in every particular to a definite type of sun legend. This cannot have been by chance, that it became attached to the person of Gilgamesh. Everything in this epic too is constant with the belief that Gilgamesh is a sun god. His connection with Shamash, who may have been his father, in the tradition given by Elian, as well as the eagle that saved him from his death. The fact that no mention is made of his father in the poem, though his mother, is brought in more than once, and the assumption throughout the epic is that he is more than human. In the case of Lugal Banda and the Anzud bird, they are one in the same, and this character may be no different. An ancient earth hero merged with an unknown mythical being. Given the key to his mythical character, it is not hard to perceive, in his adventures, the daily or annual course of the sun, rising to its full strength at noon or midsummer, and sinking at length to the western horizon to return in due time to the abode of men. 
like all solar deities, like the sun itself. His birth and origin are wrapped in mystery. He is indeed one of the fatal children, like Sargon, Perseus or Arthur. The story is also similar to the Celtic Lu and Balor. When Gilgamesh first appears in the narrative, he is already a fully grown hero, the ruler and it would seem, oppressor of a wreck. His mother, Rimat Belit, is a priestess in the temple of Ishtar, and through her, he is descended from Utnapishtim, a native of Shuripak and hero of the Babylonian flood legend. Early in the narrative, he is brought into contrast with the wild man, Iarbani, originally designed for his destruction by the gods, but with whom he eventually concludes a firm friendship. The pair proceed to do battle with the monster Kumbaba, who they overcome, as they do also with the sacred bow sent against them by Anu. Up to the end of Tablet 6, their conquering and triumphant career is without interruption. Gilgamesh increases in strength, as does the sun approaching the zenith. At the seventh tablet, however, his good fortune begins to wane. Ea Bani dies, slain by the wrath of Ishtar, whose love Gilgamesh rejected with scorn, and the hero mourning the death of his friend and smitten with fear that he himself will perish in a like manner, decides to go in search of his ancestor, Utnapishtim, who as sole survivor of the Deluge, has received from the gods deification and immortality, and Gilgamesh was to learn from him the secret of eternal life. His further adventures do not have the same vigor as his earlier exploits. Sunwise, he journeys to the mountains of the sunset, encounters the scorpion men and crosses the waters of death. Utnapishtim teaches Gilgamesh the lesson that all men must die, he himself being an exception in exceptional circumstances. And though he afterwards gives Gilgamesh an opportunity of eating the plant of life, the opportunity is lost. However, Utnapishtim cures Gilgamesh of a disease which he had contracted, apparently while crossing the waters of death, and finally he is restored to Erech. In these happenings, we see the gradual sinking of the sun into the underworld by way of the mountain of the sunset. It is impossible for the sun to attain immortality to remain forever in the land of the living. He must traverse the waters of death and so join in the underworld. Yet the return of Gilgamesh to Erech signifies the fresh dawn of the day in its eternal struggle of night and day. Summer and winter, darkness may conquer light, but light will emerge again victorious. The contest is unending some authorities have seen in the division of the epic into 12 tablets as a connection with the months of the year or the signs of the zodiac. Such a connection probably exists. But when we consider that the artificial division of the epic into tablets scarcely tallies with the natural divisions of the poem, it seems likely that the astrological significance of the months of the year was given to the epic by the scribes of Nineveh who evidently had some trouble to compress the matter into 12 tablets. The astrotheological significance of the narrative itself is one of its most important aspects. We shall perhaps be better able to judge once we have considered it in detail. I am starting to get on board with the idea that we are the balancing force here on Earth, meaning we are angels we possibly reincarnate to fulfill our purpose. But there is a moral dilemma here, 
Would you give up your purpose to be one with your Creator? If so, you may be selfish and in the eyes of God, weak and unworthy of the position. The greatest punishment would be an eternal realm of nothingness. The next part will be on Gilgamesh and Iyabani, and I will finish on Gilgamesh and Utnapishtim. Please hit that notification bell to ensure that you are notified of each upload. Share, like, comment and subscribe to support the channel. For more M7 documentaries, 